And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who Christ the who pardon me, who Christ the Lord, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's stand up and sing. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. 
And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. We're going to sing one more song. So Good morning and Merry Christmas, Creekside. Good to see you. If this is your first time with us, welcome. My name's Jeff, one of the pastors here. Thank you for joining us on Christmas morning for worship. It's your very first time. We'd love to give you a free gift, another gift today, and another free gift, a tumbler or a sippy cup or a water bottle. That's our gift to you. If it's your first time with us today, 
Uh, hey, if you're a kid, birth through preschool, there is child care. Everyone else can join us in here, but this is the ultimate sitting and standing service. Yeah, I just keep sitting and standing. So you can stand up one more time and say Merry Christmas to the people around you. So uh, several weeks ago, my wife and I got some big news. Uh, we found out that she's pregnant. And... Uh, that was our Christmas present, so we're expecting our fourth child sometime in the new year. Uh, needless to say, this was a surprise. <laughs> a very, very big surprise. Am I excited? Of course I'm excited. I am thrilled. I am so excited. But my initial response was more like shock. I was stunned. And the very first emotion I felt, honestly, was anxiety. Anxiety. Because I, uh, I know people who have four kids. <laughs> and they tell me what it's like to have four kids. Uh, as the comedian Jim Gaffigan has said, having a fourth kid is like drowning in the ocean, and then someone throws you a baby. Uh, <laughs> And so when I heard the news, my mind started racing. I said, how is this kid going to survive? How are we going to survive? How are we going to parent four kids who are 13 years apart? We might have to pay for college four times. How are we going to pay four different times? And so if you had to ask me, how did I feel anxious, troubled, very uncertain about the future? And uh, having that experience around Christmas, I think it enabled me to read the Christmas story with new eyes, because the Christmas story is all about very surprising births and how people respond to them. You know, uh, our culture presents a very sterilized version of Christmas. If you think of the pageants that you've been in or the Christmas movies we watch or even a lot of the, the carols that we sing, uh, they give this overwhelming impression that Christmas is sweet. It's tranquil. It's almost like Hallmark created this as a made-for-TV moment. But it's so interesting as you go back to the, the scriptures and the first Christmas story. As I've read it this week, I'm struck by the fact no one is tranquil in this story. No one is placid or peaceful. In fact, everyone in the story seems to be troubled uncertain, perplexed. In Luke 1, we read about Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and as he's serving in the temple, the angel Gabriel appears, and what does the text say? He is greatly troubled. Fear fell upon him. The angel tells Zechariah that God will give him a son. The son will be the forerunner to the Messiah, the one who will prepare Israel for their coming king. How does Zechariah respond? Nah, no, I'm, I'm too old to have kids. She's too old to have kids. That's how I felt, right? It's, this can't happen. What's going on? How does he feel? He's troubled. He's doubting. He's perplexed. Think about how Joseph feels when he finds out Mary is pregnant. He thinks, I know I'm not the dad. We got to call this thing off. And it takes an angel intervening to say, no, this is God's plan. Stay. You have troubled characters throughout the story, and perhaps no character is more troubled, more perplexed than Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Luke's gospel, we read this, that the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Gabriel says, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. That's not some generic greeting. This is a big deal. Gabriel is saying God is with you in a unique way, a special way that he has set you apart specifically to accomplish God's plan for the world. So, so imagine if this happened to you. Imagine Gabriel shows up at your door tonight, just finished the pie, kind of rubbing your eyes on the couch. You get a knock at the door. Boom. It's Gabriel. Greetings. The Lord is with you. How would you feel? 
Would you be thrilled? Flattered? My guess is you would ex respond exactly like Mary did. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. That's a very realistic response, isn't it? What's going on? Who are you? Why are you at my door? What's about to happen to me? Gabriel tells Mary that she will bear a son and that this son will be not just any son, but the son. The, the promised son of David, the one the whole Old Testament is pointing towards this king who will liberate Israel from her oppressors, who will liberate the world from sin and death. This is big news. How does Mary respond? She says, it's not possible. I'm a virgin. Gabriel says, Mary, nothing is impossible with God. What does Mary say? If you go fast, fast forward in the text, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And I don't think Mary is overflowing with confidence as she says those words. Let it be done to me according to thine word. I don't think that's what she says because she is apprehensive throughout this whole story. I think it's okay. I guess this is God's plan. Because it's clear that Mary is perplexed, she's anxious, she's troubled, and interestingly, she continues to feel that way as the story unfolds. Fast forward, Mary and Joseph come to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem. They come to a house, probably one of Joseph's relatives, to stay there. The house is packed. There's no room in the traditional upstairs guest room where they would have stayed. They have to stay downstairs in this house in a room where household animals would be and adjacent to this feeding trough. And that's where Mary gives birth to the king, the king of Israel. And you know what happens next. The angels appear to the shepherds and the shepherds see the angels and the angels say, go to this son who's been born and the, the shepherds come in and after all that, after the animals, after the angels, after the shepherds, Luke sums it up this way, that Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Now, what does that mean? You know, I don't know about you, but I always kind of pictured this as the hallmark moment in the story, right? Mary looks down at sweet baby Jesus who we know from every Christmas carol, never cried, ever. And his face is radiating, and, and Mary looks down, and her heart is just full. She's just taking in the sweetness of this moment. That is not the picture Luke is painting. Mary isn't sentimental. She is guarded. The sense of the text is she's bottling up her thoughts. She's not telling people what she is thinking. Why? Because she has no idea what to make of all this. Imagine how confused Mary is at this point. She knows who her son is. She knows this is a kid unlike any other. She knows this is the king of Israel, and yet she gives birth to this kid where? In a feeding trough, laying him there in the most lowly, humble of circumstances, and then shepherds show up. I mean, moms, did you like it when people walked into the delivery room? Strangers? <laughs> did you enjoy that? And now you have these grizzled night security guards for sheep, and they show up and say, we want to see your kid. Mary's pondering. I think a good translation, she's mulling this over. You ever mull something over in your head? What on earth does this mean? God, if this is the king, if this is the savior, why is he born like this? Why would you send shepherds to see him? I know you're working, but what in the world are you doing? There is, I think, a refreshing realism to the Christmas story. It's a story filled with troubled people who live in troubled times. They have no idea what God's doing, but they're hopeful that he will intervene and, and each character is just desperately trying to put the pieces together to get the meaning of the story. How does this thing get resolved? How is God going to put things in order? And, and that's ultimately what the Christmas story is about. I, I love the hymn, oh, we sing, oh, little town of Bethlehem, that line, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. All that we dread all that we hope for, all come to a fruition in this 
child who will deliver us and give us what we hope for the most. The, the low-level hum, the thing rattling in the back of each character's head in the story, you know what it is? Anxiety. These are anxious people. That's the human condition. A low-level hum of anxiety. Jesus was born to a nation riddled with fears and troubles. Israel had suffered a long national decline. After David and Solomon, they'd been ruled by kings that got successively worse and worse. Eventually, the, the nation itself splits in two and fractures, and the northern part of the nation is exiled into Assyria, and the southern part then is eventually exiled to Babylon. And even after the Israelites return to their land, things don't seem to get much better. Because even after they return to their homeland, it seems that God hasn't returned to them. They're still under foreign domination, whether it's Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, and then when Jesus arrives, it's Rome. This is a nation that has been on the brink of national extinction time and time again, and yet they have this hope. This thread that, that goes throughout all of their ancient scriptures that says a king will come, a deliverer will come, who will redeem his people and restore them to God and deliver them from what? Everything they dread. Zechariah sums it up perfectly. When he speaks of his own son, John the Baptist, and then the Messiah, he says that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. A life free from the fears that had afflicted the nation, free from the shadow of death, from enslavement, disaster, war. That's the desire. That's the hope. That, that's all of our desire is that the thing we dread doesn't come true. We want to be delivered from our fears. What the characters in this story experience is something endemic to the human condition because all of us live with this low-level, rattling hum of anxiety that's always, always, always there in the back of our heads. But Christmas is good news for anxious people. It's good news today, particularly in this cultural moment. Uh, we live in an anxious age, don't we? It, you know, it's interesting. About 100 years ago, uh, the atheist Bertrand Russell wrote a book entitled Why I Am Not a Christian. It became enormously popular, but in that book, Russell makes what I think is one of the worst predictions of the 20th century, one of the worst. Russell theorized that much of humanity's fear is rooted in religion, in, in our superstitious belief in God. And, and here was Russell's theory that, that humans dread the unknown, we dread what is mysterious, and so we naturally want a big brother in the sky to take care of us or a father to look after us who will allay our fears so that, that, that we have protection from the things we, we dread. But, but here was Russell's prediction that as we learn more about the natural world, the world will get less mysterious. As we advance in technology, we'll have more mastery over the world, we'll have more control. And as our fears subside, we will see that we don't have to rely on a God to deliver us from our fears, that ultimately we can deliver ourselves from our fears. Through our own knowledge, our own mastery, we'll be feared from what he calls our cra freed from our craven fear. We won't need to look for some God for support. Instead, we'll look to ourselves and our own efforts to make this world what he says will be a, quote, fit place to live in. Here's what's interesting about Russell's prediction. Much of what he predicted is exactly what happened. Scientific knowledge, it's just exploded over the last hundred years. It's amazing how much more we know now than we did then. Technological mastery, I mean, we have control over the world that our ancestors couldn't have fathomed. Has it made us less anxious, less fearful? This is the age of anxiety. Everyone calls it that. Anxiety is an epidemic especially among young people. Back in 2014, a giant Penn State study found that the number one mental health diagnosis for college students, it actually was no longer depression, anxiety had overtaken it. And those numbers continue to grow. We're an increasingly anxious people. And it's ironic because by any measure, we are the safest people who have ever lived on the face of the earth. 
Some refer to this as the safety paradox. Why is it that we're getting safer and more anxious at the same time? Ironically, and this is what Russell couldn't have predicted, it's because of science and technology. That actually fuels our anxiety rather than alleviating it. How? Well, here's the thing. I can pick up my phone and, and I'm connected to this sort of digital nervous system that connects me to everyone in the world. And I can pull up in a minute and find out every bad thing happening in the world right now. I'm bombarded with terrible news and complex issues, but because I'm connected to this digital nervous system, I have some sense that I'm responsible for this. That I can actually do something to fix these things. So I'm bombarded with more problems than I could possibly solve with some vague sense that I can do something to solve it. What does that create? Well, Mark Sayers says what it creates is ambient anxiety. I love that term, ambient anxiety. Here's what that means. Have you ever felt this way? You feel anxious and you have no idea why, and you can't nail down what it is. You just know I should be anxious about something right now. That's ambient anxiety. It's this feeling that, man, I might check my email and there might be a terrible message waiting for me in there. Or I might pull up social media and I might learn something I really didn't want to learn. Or I could pull up my news feed. I don't even have to wonder. I know it's going to be bad things on my news feed today. It's just this free-floating sense that there is horrible things that I need to be aware of and that I need to fix. That's the spirit of the age. So what kind of hope does Christmas offer for anxious people living in anxious times? Well, the first thing we can say is this. God's solution for our anxiety is diametrically opposed to what the world offers us. Because here's what the world offers as a cure for anxiety. The world constantly bombards us with two things. Bad news and good advice. Bad news, and it tries to give us good advice. That's a paralyzing combination. And here's why. At the push of a button, you can learn the five worst things that happened in the world today, right? That's the news cycle. Uh, but then you get all of this advice, all of these tips, all of these strategies, and we are continually assured that we have the answer to life's problems whether they be personal problems or global problems. And so whether it's getting the dream job or finding the right spouse or avoiding illness from COVID or fixing the environment or ensuring that our kids turn out okay, these are basically problems to be solved if we have enough information and if everyone acts in the right way. And so you have infinitely complex problems and it's all on us to fix them. What does that make us? It makes each of us the general manager of the universe. That if I know enough and I'm wise enough and I, I make enough right decisions, the information's out there, I just need to know it, well, then I can control my life, I can control my outcomes, we can control this world, we can fix it. However, it's on us. Good luck. Here's the problem with that. That hope for control is an idol. And it's an idol that recedes with every step we take towards it. Because here's the paradox of learning. The more you learn, the more you learn that you have to be afraid of. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. The more you try to control your life, the more variables you learn that you are not in control of. And so ironically, as you grow in knowledge and mastery, you will feel less knowledgeable and less in control than ever before because life is more complex than we could possibly imagine. The, the world offers us a paralyzing option. Be the general manager of the universe. God doesn't offer what the world offers. What did the angels announce on the night of Christ's birth? You, you know, this is one thing. This is just a pet peeve about Christmas, okay? So this is my little rant. So just, just bear with me, okay? One of the things I just hate around Christmas time is when people talk about the real meaning of Christmas. Oh, my gosh. Because inevitably, the real meaning of Christmas is like kindness, sharing, treating other people with affection, being generous. In other words, the spirit of Christmas is morality for us. That has nothing to do with what Christmas is. Christmas is not about us. It's not advice for us. Christmas is news. It's not good advice. It's good news. 
What is the good news? Luke 2. And the angel said to them, Fear not, anxious people, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What do anxious people long to hear? Is it good advice? No. You want good news, don't you? Proverbs 12, 25 says that anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Good news. When you're diagnosed with cancer, do you want good advice? Is that going to cheer you up? Just to pound a little more kale, walk every day, get more treatment. Is that going to alleviate your anxiety? No, the thing that will alleviate your anxiety is, hey, good news, the cancer is 100% gone. It's not coming back. That's what you long to hear. God gives us something so much better than good advice. He gives us himself. Good news of great joy for the world to alleviate our fears. See, if, if life is a cosmic accident, do you know what that means? I am the general manager of the universe. It's on me. But if this world was created by a good and loving God who is invested in redeeming and restoring this world, then I can view anxiety differently. In fact, I can view the root of my anxiety differently because according to the Bible, the reason we're so anxious, if you get down to the bottom of it, the fundamental reason is because we are trying to play a role in the world we were never meant to play. General manager of the universe. And that's sin. Sin is ignoring God, rejecting God, pushing against his control over everything and saying, I need to be in control to be okay. According to the Bible, all of us have made that decision. We are alienated from God. We are trying to fulfill this role of managing the universe. It's something we cannot bear and therefore we feel unbearable anxiety. We can't control life. We know we can't control life. The good news is this, that Jesus was born to deliver us from our fears. That all we dread will not come upon us. That ultimately there is a happy ending. That ultimately we will be okay. Not because we have a perfect plan, but because God does. See, Jesus is not first and foremost a philosopher or a sage or even a teacher. Jesus is a rescuer. He's a deliverer, and the entire Bible is a rescue story. This is not fables and allegories to teach morals. This is an account of God's interaction in history to deliver us from sin and death. And the whole Bible points to this deliverer. In Genesis 3, we learn that he will be a human from the seed of a woman. In Genesis 12, we learn that this human will come from the family of Israel. In Genesis 49, we learn that he'll be from the tribe of Judah. In 2 Samuel 7, that he'll be one of David's descendants, a king like David. In Micah 5, we learn that he will be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. And God gives clue after clue to the coming deliverer. And in Jesus, we see God make good on every promise. Christianity is diametrically opposed to every other human system and religion because every human system of religion says this, that humanity will do good and ascend to divinity. Christianity says that divinity descended to humanity to be with us forever. Christianity is not our ascent to God. It is God's descent to us in the person of Christ. That, that God, the eternal Son, Jesus Christ, took on our human nature to be our champion, to rewrite our story. Jesus is born, he becomes a human being to live the life we should have lived, the life we failed to live, a life of perfect dependence on God, trusting he's in control. And Jesus lived that life so that it could be credited to us, so that his story could become our story. But Jesus wasn't just born to live, but ultimately to die to die for our sins, our failures, our obsessive need to control life apart from God. He dies and takes the consequences of that on himself on the cross. 
He dies to exhaust the power of sin and death and God's judgment and rises to restore humanity to God so that we can live with him forever. And the moment you trust in Jesus is day one of eternal life. A life where you can finally learn what it's like to not put every care on yourself, but to be just cared for by God. By the God who created you and loves you. That's Christianity. It's not a story about us finding our way to God. It's about God finding his way to us. God knows we cannot manage life on our own. That's why he offers to manage it for us. And Christmas is the decisive proof that this creator God, he is invincibly committed to this world. What more could God do to prove his commitment to us than to take on a human nature forever to be our savior and redeemer? That's the good news, that God will redeem this world, that he will redeem us, that everything sad will come untrue, that every wrong will be righted, all that's dark will be made light, that we will be okay, that we will be delivered from our fears. And the best way to live, the way we were created to live, is to live just being cared for by God. That's far better than carrying the weight of the world on ourselves. Jesus already carried that weight so that we don't have to. Let's pray. So we thank you for the wonder of Christmas, God, that ultimately is about you, Jesus, bridging a gap that we could never bridge, the, the, the chasm between a holy God and a sinful humanity. Thank you, Jesus, for becoming one of us forever, to live as our champion and representative. Thank you that you could not have done more to show your commitment to us. Would we find such peace and joy in knowing that ultimately our only responsibility is to trust you and know that you have things well in hand because you care for us so well. In your name, amen. Everyone, let's stand and sing joy to the world. Christmas.
Have a great day. See you next year.